Okay, hello and welcome to this city, Capitola City Council meeting in accordance with the current Santa Cruz County shelter in place order and the governor's executive order N2920. This meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. As always, this city council meeting is a cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and will be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on the Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Len Dunton is our technician this evening. Thank you, Len. If you are watching on Community TV and would instead prefer to join the Zoom webinar, please visit the City of Capitola homepage and click on City Council under upcoming events, as you can see here on the screen. As a webinar attendee, your microphone is muted for the entire presentation unless you request to be unmuted during a public comment period. You do not need a microphone, camera, the internet, or a computer if you only want to listen to the meeting as this meeting is accessible by landline or mobile phone. To join the webinar using a telephone only, Dial any of the following numbers now shown on the screen. The webinar ID is also provided. To make a public comment, the mayor will announce the public comment period for each item. If you are a Zoom webinar attendee, you can raise your hand as a participant and wait to be unmuted by our moderator. If you've called into the Zoom webinar, with your phone, just hit star nine to raise your hand and you will be unmuted by our moderator. You can also send an email to the address displayed on the screen. Please remember that the mayor will announce the public comment period for each item. One comment, verbal or emailed, not both, per person, per item is allowed. If you send more than one email about the same item, the last received will be read and displayed. You may not speak an email about the same item. Comments received outside the public comment period will not be included in the record. Thank you for joining us, and I'll turn this over to Mayor Peterson to call the meeting to order. Thank you so much. So we'll call tonight's meeting to order. Can I start with the roll call, please? Absolutely. Council Member Botorf. Here. Council Member Bertrand. Here. Council Member Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. And Mayor Peterson. Here. Thank you. Uh, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And we're going to move on to a report on closed session. Do we have a report out from our closed session from our? Sorry, I, I couldn't figure out how to unmute. Uh, closed session was held on the item on the agenda and direction was given staff. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have any additional materials for tonight's meeting? No. All right. Uh, do we have any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? The only sta change staff proposes is item 8E, which is to continue the zoning code discussion. That's on your agenda with a recommendation for continuance. Uh, and you may want to just remove it from the agenda at this time. All right, do we need a vote to do that? I think, I think so, yes. Yeah. yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, continue that item and remove it from tonight's agenda. This is a second. 
We have a motion from Council Member Story, a second from Council Member Bertrand. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Council Member Bator? Aye. Council Member Bertrand? Aye. Council Member Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to public comments. Now is the time for uh, members of the public to address the council on any item not on tonight's agenda. Uh, we will begin with, uh, we'll have our moderator, uh, Larry, letting us know of people who have their hand raised and would like to speak. Uh, we will have our staff in the chambers running the um, timer for three minutes. And then after we've heard from those joining the meeting uh, in person, we will go to email to see if there's an additional uh, public comment. Again, this is for items not on tonight's agenda, and you will have three minutes to speak. And I'll turn it over to you, Larry. Yes, Mayor Peterson, I have at this point two hands raised. The first person to talk is phone number ending at 854. Bill? Okay. Yes, hi. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Lisa Berkowitz, and I'm the Program Director for Meals on Wheels, a program of Community Bridges. I'll be making comments later on in the evening during the budget discussions, but I did want to, however, take the opportunity during public comment to ask the council to please consider the use of CDBG funding to offset some of the recommended funding cuts to community programs. Um, in these challenging times, the services being provided have become true lifelines for so many capital or Capitola residents. Um, Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, now I have one community bridges. Hi everybody, this is Ray Cantino from Community Bridges, uh, CEO. Just wanted to echo um, similar sentiments as what Lisa uh, briefly described around CDBG funding. I know that you had a discussion at your last meeting uh, concerning how to best use those resources uh, we wanted to advocate uh, consideration of having a preferential treatment uh, for existing service providers in your community um, to have a uh, preference point in terms of anal uh, analyzing uh, what you might receive in terms of CDBG funded projects uh, and to use that as an opportunity to kind of uh, safeguard existing essential services that are currently being proposed to be cut in your fiscal year 2021 uh, budget. And so uh, we would like to just ask that uh, the council consider that and the staff consider that and how they uh, do an RFP for those funding resources uh, locally. Thank you. Larry, I'm going to turn it back over to you. It looks like we maybe have one more uh, public yeah, comment. Sorry, I'm sorry, I, I muted myself. Uh, Kurt Ansey, sorry, if you're available. Yes, uh, good, good evening, Mayor and Council members. This is Kirk Ants. I'm the program director for LiftLine, a program of Community Bridges. We're also the designated consolidated transportation service agency for Santa Cruz County. And I'd like to thank you for all the years of funding to LiftLine, over two decades that I've worked for LiftLine, uh, we've always gotten funded through the city of Capitola, which has helped us uh, greatly to provide services to seniors and individuals with disabilities, to medical appointments and access to meals. So thank you very much, that's gone a long ways. And last funding period uh, the, through the city of Capitola, LiftLine, in a, in a sense gave money back as we were receiving $50,000 in funding prior years and we got additional funding through Measure D. So we took the opportunity to say, we, we've got extra funding now, we'd like to give some back to Capitola so they could use it for other um, service program, uh, um, social service programs or as they seem fit. And, of course, we could always use the money and spend it on stuff, but we, we thought it would be good. We thought it was the, the right thing to do. And right now, LiftLine um, 
is looking at almost a $600,000 deficit for next fiscal year. So I've had to go in and trim the budget as much as I can. And we just started layoff process. So we're laying off approximately 29% uh, percent of our, our uh, workforce. And this is a time when we could really use some funding. So maybe if it's not even the full amount, uh, some of it uh, could help provide additional rights to those that uh, need uh, essential services, uh, medical appointments, and meals. And we've stepped up to the plate. We're working with Great Plates now, delivering meals for that program, as well as Meals on Wheels. And Meals on Wheels contacted me today, and it looks like there's a need to increase what we could do, so we'll be looking at that. But thank you very much. I want to uh, encourage you to look at the uh, CDBG funding, see if there's any possibilities there. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Turn it back to you. Yeah, I've got Karen Delaney. Good evening, council members. This is Karen Delaney from the Volunteer Center. I did not see the budget later on this evening. So if you'd like, you know, because I do want to address the budget. Is, is there a specific agenda item later about the budget? The budget is item nine. B on tonight or 8B on tonight's agenda? Okay, then I'll just wait. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, okay. It'll I, don't, I don't see any more hands raised, and I do not see any email comments for, uh, for public comments at this time. Okay, great. And if those who have their hands raised uh, could hit the, the button to lower your hand so that as we move forward, we'll be able to tell if you're um, speaking on a new item or, or not. Um, but thank you so much for your public comment. Um, seeing that we have no email public comment, we will uh, close um, general public comment now and move on to city council uh, and staff comments. Does staff have any comments tonight? I think our community development director is gonna give us a little update. Good evening, Mayor Peterson and Council. This is Katie Harlegi, your Community Development Director. I did want to bring the Council up to date that our ad hoc committee met yesterday to discuss CWG funding. Um, the notice of funding availability was posted last Friday and Capitola will be receiving approximately $80,000 in funds. That combined with our $88,000 in program income brings us to $168,000 approximately in funding. Um, as discussed at prior meetings, uh, at two prior meetings with our resolution passing, the funds will be going towards public services, housing facilities for homeless, and economic development. There are going to be three rounds for CBG funding. During this first round, we're going to focus on, this is what came out of our ad hoc committee, is public services and economic development. During the next round, we'll broaden that to include the funding for the homelessness. homelessness. There are some things we need to work out as with the county um, regarding previous um, partnerships we've had there in the past to, to um, contribute to our regional efforts. So I just wanted to bring you up to date on that. And so that will include under public services, housing assistance and food, and under economic development, um, forgivable loans to businesses. So that's my update for this evening. Great, thank you. Is there any additional staff comments? I think that does it for this evening. Thanks. All right. Uh, we'll continue with council comments. Uh, and I see that we have three council members with their hands up. Um, before we go to additional council comments, I, I'd like to uh, start us off if, um, if that's appropriate, if no one minds. Uh, and I would like to start with the, um, with the acknowledgement of the service and the tragic loss of life of one of our Santa Cruz Sheriff Sergeant, Sergeant Damon Gusweiler, who is a 14 year veteran of the Sheriff's Department. And according to Sheriff Jim Hart, he was, and I quote, a picture of community policing. And Sergeant, uh, excuse me, Sergeant Gutzweiler lost his life tragically this past weekend uh, in an act of senseless violence. And I would like us to take a moment, please, uh, of silence to reflect on his service to our community and uh, the loss 
to our sheriff's department, to our law enforcement community, to his family, um, and take this moment to honor him uh, and, and all those who are, are protecting us and, and looking out for our, our public safety during these times. So if we could please take a moment of silence. Thank you. We will move on now. I see uh, all of our council members have their uh, hands up for comments. So I'll start, uh, if we've been in the chambers, I'd start at one end and move down to the other. So we'll start with council member Story. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, you know, I as well um, wanted to pay tribute to Sergeant um, Damon Gutzweiler. Um, you know, who was tragically killed last Saturday, June 6th, in the line of duty. You know, and it's another, you know, stark reminder of how our um, first responders and our, and our safety officers put their lives on the line um, every day, you know, when they go out to serve the community. And I just wanted to take this time to uh, acknowledge that to, to them um, and let them know how much we appreciate um, their taking on that risk. And, and in this case, um, the ultimate sacrifice that was made. And I wanted to send my uh, condolences to uh, Sergeant uh, Guthweiler's uh, family um, and, and to Sergeant Hart and to all um, of uh, the officers in our county sheriff's department. I know they, they have gone through a lot and will continue to go through, through a lot as they grapple with this tremendous loss. And I hope that we as a council and the city can um, reach out to the sheriff part uh, and the sheriff's department um, to let them know that we're there for them and share, um, you know, in their loss. Um, and um, and I, would, I would also maybe ask Mayor if we could maybe um, hold this meeting in honor of Sergeant uh, Gus Water. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Council Member Story. I think that's um, um, a great idea and a, and a good way to honor his memory to hold tonight's, um, tonight's meeting in his honor and in his memory. Thank you for those comments. Uh, we'll move down the virtual dais to Council uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. I just want to echo what Council Member Story has just shared, as well as you, Mayor Peterson. My deepest condolences to the family. Um, this is an absolute tragedy, and it, it, it just really, really breaks my heart. Um, I also want to say that, in addition to that, I'm deeply saddened and appalled by, by lots of things happening in America right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> and I'm compelled to speak up. Um, what I wanted to share also was um, that as, a, as an aside to the protests regarding Black Lives Matter, as a leader in our community, I feel it is necessary to, to use my voice to express my support and sympathy of the many lives that have been lost. As a community, we must practice anti-racism in order to shift the paradigm. Our county and local police officers do an exceptional job and have participated in implicit bias and de-escalation training. However, racism is real and it exists everywhere, even in Capitola. Therefore, we must take action to be part of the solution. I will continue to exercise my privilege as an elected official to speak fearlessly and with cause. And I will continue to remind our community of my message at every state city council meeting until the protests have ended. When I look back at this time, I want to be proud of our history and changes that were made during my service. I want to be part of the solution, and I hope our community does too. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Appreciate your comments. Um, let's see, we're moving on down. We're going to go to Council Member Bertrand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think Sam and Yvette, you know, has expressed very eloquently what I feel, certainly about the loss in the Sheriff's Department, 
the families that they have of their fellow sheriffs and their personal families. Um, what's happening around the world, not just around this nation, gives us pause when we think about what we consider our government and our society really is. And that's something we have to think about very deeply. So I'm not going to go and talk about what I think it is. I think the main thing is everyone that's listening, you have to have that conversation with yourself, your family, with the people that you hold dear. And the whole idea that we're in a community is considerably important. When you, when you think about what is your role in that community? So what you see right now, do you want that to be reflective of the community that you feel comfortable in? The other thing I'd like to talk about is, you know, I've read letters, um, especially about a lack of funding for community services. And one of the things that's coming out of the discussions right now around our country is the fact that the services that we've defunded are often the essential services that help society function. The services that we've defunded are going to cause great pain to many, many people. This is something that we don't take lightly. I don't think the agencies want to hear that, but we're in a dire situation. So I'd like to remind our board, Capitola City Council, of our commitment to continue our process to make the decisions that we need to make. What kind of community services are we going to fund? What is going to be our sense of how we're going to support this community and make this community a better place through our sense of through, through our contribution to the city of Capitol. As we move forward to that process, I'd like to remind everyone on the city council that Capitola has traditionally been very generous. We've traditionally given a lot to the community services that this whole broader community depends on. So I just want to end with that reminder. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. And um, finally, thank you for your patience. Council Member Bottorf will come to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I first want to concur with all the comments by the mayor and all of the city council members, uh, each touching on a different area, but yet uh, carrying a common thread. Uh, I agree with all the comments that were made, and I support each one of those positions. I have more of a uh, different issue I'd like to bring up but relating to some, uh, some local business for us. Uh, I just want to share that in my early years on the council, there was sometimes a, a disconnect between the planning commission and the city council. This disconnect caused confusion to citizens and led to many appealed decisions. Under the direction of the city manager, a series of meetings were held and both groups worked together to create a better cooperative relationship. The city operates more efficiently when that relationship is stable. A planning commission that supports the goals of the city council and applies the city's existing ordinances makes for less confusion. Two weeks ago, I watched the Planning Commission meeting and I was dismayed with the discussions on numerous items on the agenda. In my opinion, four out of five commissioners stray outside their role. By definition, the Planning Commission's primary role, as its name applies, is to plan. A Planning Commission is a body of citizens that serve within a local government acting on as, as an advisory group to the municipal governing body on issues and policies relating to planning, land use, regulation, and community development. As was mentioned, we are in very sensitive times right now where many different public platforms are being used or misused for improper communication. We recently created a social media policy just to address that topic. Planning commissioners should not use their own personal politics in their comments. That is left up to the city council. They should acknowledge any personal relations they may have with community members if they feel it may impact their vote. They should not offer personal opinions relating to the city's agreed expenditure plans and their decisions. 
We already have a finance committee that advises the city council on those matters. I appreciate the planning commission and I invite and encourage any member of that planning commission body to attend the city council meeting and share their personal opinions on any topic they choose. I also invite them to bring it as a body to bring forth any idea that they feel may improve our city. But barring any ordinance changes, their role is to apply the current codes and ordinances in their decisions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Bossor. All right, uh, with that, we've come to the conclusion of council, city council and staff comments. Where'd my pen go? And we will move on to uh, item seven, our consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are enacted by one motion in the form listed on the agenda. Uh, unless any member of the public or any member of the council would like to pull an item for separate discussion. I'll go first to uh, the public to see if there's any member of the public that would like to pull an item from the consent calendar. And I'll turn it over to our moderator, our moderator rather, Larry, uh, to let us know. Uh, it looks like there might be a hand up, but I'm not sure if it's to remove an item from consent or not. I, I don't know. Um, I'll find out. Julie, were you asking to uh, remove an item from consent or were you wanting to talk about an, another item on the agenda? Uh, that was done by mistake, so my apologies. Okay. I'm, I'm just listening in. Okay. Okay. No problem. All right. Oh. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Larry. I was just seeing if there was a no, no there's no le emails either. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, we will turn it over to the council. Are there any members of the council that would like to pull an item? I see three hands up. I will start with Council Member Brooks. Vice Mayor Brooks, excuse me. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, I have a question about item 7C and a question about item 7D. Okay, do you want to pull them for a separate discussion after we voted on A and B? Please, please. Okay. Um, so we're pulling item C and item D for separate discussion. Uh, okay, everyone's got their hands up. Let's just work on down the line. Council Member Bertrand, did you have an item you wanted to pull? Uh, no, I don't want to uh, pull an item. I just want to comment on an item. Was it item C or D? It's uh, the minutes, and it's not C and D. Okay. So my right. comment, um, I thank you for the clerk in putting in starting a new tradition that when a member of city council has an item for the agenda, that it's actually noted. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, council member Story. Oh, you're still, you're still muted, Councilman Sorry. There we go. Excuse me, I must say it twice. Um, I, I didn't necessarily want to pull an item, but uh, it's my, I'm speaking in reference to item 7D um, and just letting and reporting that um, I would recuse myself from that item since I am a member um, that would be a subject to that assessment, the BIA assessment. Um, so, um, but if that's going to be discussed separately, um, uh, I'll just refuse myself at that time. Thank you. Great, thank you. Council Member Bosworth? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I did have a correction to the minutes, and I don't know how you want to do that. Uh, Council Member Bosworth? If you'd like it on item A. Council Member Bottorf, I'm not sure if it's just on my end, but you're cutting out a little bit there. I know sometimes when you turn your video off, it, it makes it a little bit uh, easier on the internet. So you can try again and, and maybe with camera or without camera, but um, if you could repeat what you just said, because I'm not sure we caught it. Sorry about that. I'll try again. I have a correction to the minutes, and I can make that correction if you'd like. Sure. Uh, uh, on page uh, uh, nine of the packet, uh, I don't, I don't want to pay for this 10 years from now. It says Council Member Bodor said that he loves the idea of closing the Esplanade. And I what it would have, should have said is Council Member Bodor said that people love the idea of closing the Esplanade. So, uh, and so the city, I did listen to that video and it was very garbly. So I'm sure the city clerk had a terrible time trying to decipher that. But if she could just change the word from he to people 
That would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Okay, so we uh, are going to, so at this time we will entertain a motion to approve consent calendar item 7A with the uh, requested changes and item 7B, and that will be our consent calendar, and then we will come back and discuss B and D separately. So do we have a, a motion? I move item 7A and 7B, 7A with corrections. I'll second. Motion by Council Member Bertrand, second by Council Member Bosworth. Can we have a roll call, please? Roll call vote? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Bottorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll go to uh, consent calendar uh, item 7C. Um, Council uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, you wanted this item pulled? Yes, please. Um, my question was, uh, it, the way I read it was that we were adopting this resolution based off of the, uh, the budget that we're approving tonight, um, is how I read it. So I just wanted to seek some clarification. It just kind of seemed like we were approving something, approving this before we've actually approved the budget. So I'll ask our finance director, Jim Malberg, to respond. And Jim, if you could just give us maybe a 10 second kind of overview on what the item is so the public's aware of what we're talking about, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so the, the GAN limit was enacted back in 1979 following uh, Prop 13, and it was basically designed to put a limit on the amount of tax revenues that we could appropriate each year. And we're required to go through this cal uh, calculation and we get the factors directly from the state. And basically what it does is it takes our, our tax base from 1979-80, I think it's been modified once or twice, and we're allowed to grow that by population growth and um, inflation. And so each year we have to go through this calculation and then adopt it by resolution that sets our appropriation limit on tax revenue. So what we do is we do the calculation, we put it in there, and then we add the information about this year's proposed budget just to demonstrate that we are well below the GAN limit. So we're not, it, they're tied together, but you're not adopting, the GAN limit is separate from the budget in that you're setting that limit and then you're adopting the budget later. So having them on the same agenda is good. And then um, I think the takeaway from the GAN limit shows that over the last 35, 40 years, we have not kept up with inflation, not even halfway with inflation, because we're below 50% of what our GAN limit is allowed. I don't know if that's helpful. Jim, I don't think you've answered my question, though. Um, is it okay to approve this before we approve the budget? Yes, you're approving the limit right now. So we're just showing you the limit is what you're approving that we will not spend more than $31 million in tax revenues. So that's all you're approving is that we won't go over that threshold. The proposed budget is added just to show you that we're only at about 10 million this year. I was going to say, can we clarify that we don't collect $31 million in, in taxes? <laughs> I, okay. All right, uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, did that uh, cover your, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so that was item 7C. Uh, and if I could get guidance from staff quickly from our uh, city manager or city attorney, since these items were both pulled, um, can we address them both now and then vote on them together? As if they had been on consent calendar, do we need to vote on them separately now? You should vote separately. Okay. All right, so um, it sounds like Vice Mayor Brooks had her questions answered for item 7C, um, so we will entertain a motion. I so move to approve item 7C. Second. Second. All right, uh, mo motion by Vice Mayor Brooks, second by, uh, I can't tell if that was Councilmember Gosworth or Councilmember Bertrand. It was Bertrand, but it doesn't matter. Okay, Count, uh, uh, motion by Brooks, second by Bertrand. Uh, can we have a roll call vote? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Bottorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. 
Aye. Great. Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you. Uh, next is consent calendar item 7D, which was also pulled. Uh, you had some questions, Vice Mayor Brooks? Yeah, it was, um, thank you. It was regarding the, the numbers that were presented in the staff report. Um, there were agencies that were represented here that seemed to have closed or maybe closing. And um, I was just curious about that because we'll be approving the numbers here, but for this for this under this item, I was curious if we should be approving that or the the actual updated numbers. I'll refer this to Jim Malberg again. Jim, if you have any questions that you think would be more appropriately answered by the BIA, if they're on the call as well, and we could refer something to them. And Jim, could you give us a little summary of what this item is about? Sure, absolutely. Um, this is for setting the public hearing date to do the assessment levies for the business improvement area down in the, the village. And each year we prepare this roster at this point and we need to list all the businesses as best we can um, each year businesses close and new businesses come in, so it's never a perfect science. This is just simply kind of a snapshot in time. And I did reach out to uh, Karin Hahn about this question, and um, she said basically her approach is when a business closes, once they move all of their belongings out of an office, then they're removed from the list. But we have cases where a business says it's going to close, then they actually open back up, then they continue to do business. So we don't pull them off of the roster until they're actually empty spaces. And that answers. But I could, um, like I said, Karen is on the call as well as um, the BI president, Anthony Guajardo. No, that makes sense to me. Thank you. All right. Um, Okay, so if there's no additional uh, questions from the council on this item, we will uh, entertain a motion and a second. I'll still move item 7D for approval. I'll second. Okay. Moved by Vice Mayor Brooks, seconded by Councilmember Bator. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Bator. Aye. Councilmember Story. McHugh. Thank you. And uh, Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries uh, with four in favor and one recusal. Thank you. We're going to move on to our general government items now. We'll start with uh, item 8A, an update on the city's pandemic response, and I will turn it over to staff for a staff report. All right. Madam Mayor, members of the council, it's going to take me a little moment here before I can start sharing my screen. Please bear with me. Okay, is my screen, uh, can people see that? I will take that as a yes. So this is, I think, the sixth update we've done on the COVID-19 emergency declaration for the city of Capitola. This is some of our updates from our regional case counts from Santa Cruz County Health Office. You will notice that um, we saw relatively nice declines in through towards the end of May. And then after Mother's Day, there was a spike in cases. Cases came back down. And recently, we uh, just yesterday, we saw our high, high number of new cases was eight reported yesterday. And I believe there was actually four the day before. So 12 came in yesterday. So that's that's an item of a bit of concern. Um, certainly don't like to see those case numbers climbing, so we'll have to watch that carefully in the next week or two. This is some more data that we pulled from the uh, County of Santa Cruz, and it shows where Santa Cruz County sits in terms of the other counties around the state. This is showing um, the further down you are in this chart, it's the fewer cases you have per capita. So Santa Cruz is doing better than most counties in terms of fewer cases per capita. And the flatter your line is, the better your county is doing. The steeper line, for example, here where you see Marin, Marin is having caseload growing relatively more quickly. Our caseload is growing relatively flat. So our case numbers look quite good, certainly better than other places where you can see much higher levels of the, uh, of the virus. 
Statewide, though, the numbers certainly don't look super promising. Um, we have new cases continuing to grow on a relatively, at this point, looks like a linear scale. In addition, the deaths per day has remained relatively stubbornly um, the same it's through the middle of May at about peaking out each week at about 100 deaths per day, which is obviously concerning as we begin to open up more of the economy. Will, will this trigger these numbers to continue to grow or are we going to sit here uh, through the summer at these levels? Uh, regionally, in, on May 30th, the state approved our variance for Santa Cruz County. That's actually the county's variance to move into the later stages of phase two, which has allowed in-person dining and restaurants to open up. Uh, and I believe some hair salons. Um, and then on June 9th, our health officer issued an updated health order that really aligns our local orders with the state resilience roadmap. And that means that coming up, I believe it is tomorrow, hotels and short-term vacation rentals allowing tourism, that'll begin uh, be allowed in our county. Movie theaters with significant restrictions on occupancy. Uh, museums, galleries, aquariums, um, those can open as well, again, with restrictions. Um, and same thing with gyms, pubs, wineries, and swimming pools. The order that maintains the beach closure and the uh, facial covering requirements continues at this point through July 6th. That beach closure, as people are aware, closes our beaches to public use between 11 and 5 o'clock each day, although the water remains open um, at other times of the day, during all times of the day. On your agenda this evening is to ratify emergency order 4 2020. This order was issued since our last meeting when council gave direction to establish a process by which to allow over the counter permits to allow businesses to have more outdoor dining, particularly in the right of way in the Capitola village. In addition, allows over the counter permits for other activities to take place in private parking lots outside of normal uses like parking and parking lots. It also creates a temporary, um, uh, sorry, a uh, over-the-counter permit for takeout windows. So emergency order 2020 was issued and you, on your agenda this evening is to ratify that order. Um, there are a few other elements to order uh, for 2020. It reinstated the three-hour parking limit in the village, opened up the upper and lower beach parking lots, and allows for um, staff and PD to enforce 15-minute parking zones in the village for curbside pickup. So outdoor dining, our staff has been working really hard with members of the BIA and businesses down there to get this set up. Uh, this is a picture I believe from today on the Esplanade. There's been somewhere in the order of 100 custom stanchions to hold the ropes that designate the dining areas built. Uh, the flower pots have been, um, all the, have been installed. Uh, we've had a local volunteer, Nels Westman, has built 10 accessibility ramps. Our, Public, our building inspectors have gone out and inspected them to make sure that they're up to snuff. Our public works department really put the pedal to the metal this last two weeks in getting the benches and getting everything set up for the outdoor dining as well as building up the beach this week. And then planning uh, had an all hands on deck moment last week and everybody was out there in the field going door to door, um, working with each individual permit to get the administrative agreements in place so that they could open up. And the city attorney's office helped and created a liability uh, waiver so that if people wanted to use the benches, not just as traffic barriers, but as seating, that we would have that liability waiver in place as well. Um, we also uh, have put in place some, just done it this week, some handouts and gone door to door with the businesses about how to sort of set this up and comply with social distancing requirements, uh, gave direction to restaurants to space the edges of the tables nine and a half feet apart, put marks in the ground where the tables are to ensure that if the tables get moved, that people can see and move them back and helps people understand the six foot separation and facial covering requirements that are in the health order. So that's proactive work that our staff is doing to try to help get better compliance um, in the village. I will also note that we have uh, banners on order. I expect they'll be up in the very near future that encourage people to wear banners while in the Capitola Village. 
as a summary of where we stand with our facilities at this point city hall and police department and city parks are all open the play structures remain closed the wharf is open and the beach parking lots including Drew cliff drive are open our closed facilities are the beach during the days from 11 to 5 as i mentioned earlier the community center and the museum for the time being although we will be looking at the the state resilience roadmap and figuring out what it takes for our museum to open up this summer um, as we get ready for that. And so with that, uh, I'm available for council questions. All right, let me pull up the participants tab again so I can see what's going on. Uh, council member Story, it looks like, has a question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jamie, on um, the total case update, um, do we have any um, uh, information uh, about cases in Capitola and uh, would that uh, data even uh, be possible to obtain? So I just went back to look. That data is available and it is on the County Health Department website. I believe our case number is currently eight. Um, if I remember correctly, I believe it may have been six at our last meeting and five the meeting before, but that's off memory. So our case number, I do believe, is eight when I saw today. It's on the next next dashboard that I did, unfortunately did not clip for tonight's meeting. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for that reference, too. Um, um, but I, I think it would be good as we get regular updates that we kind of uh, focus in, if you could give us information on the Capitola cases and how they're trending. Um, you know, my other question is concerning um, the um, social distancing protocol. I noticed in the last order that uh, the public health officer now has deemed those to be voluntary and not mandatory. Um, and um, But at the same time, the beach restriction um, and the distancing requirements, uh, including the wearing of face masks, are still mandatory. Um, that seems like a mixed message. And I wonder, um, are our businesses uh, posting the protocols? Uh, do they have those in place? Um, and will they continue to do so? Um, and and then what, and I was wondering, what are the ways are we um, trying to get the message to, um, you know, the visitors, particularly to the village? that it's still uh, necessary for them to social distance, to wear face masks, and also frequently, um, you know, wash their hands. So I'll answer the first part of the question, and then I think I'll turn it over to Katie Hurley here for the second part. The first part of the question, what we have planned at this point is to, to do the banners uh, over Cap Ave and Monterey that encourage people to wear the face masks. We also have our existing signage that's out in the village that talks about social distancing and the need for it. We've been in regular communication with the businesses about how they're asking people to socially distance and the notices that they have. And Katie, I think I'll turn it over for you for about what, what the businesses are doing about how they're um, informing people of the masks and what you know on that. Katie? Yes, yeah, so um, thank you, Jamie, and uh, council member Story. The businesses each have a business that have a COVID-19 plan that they're required to post near their entryway. So any restaurant is, that is open or store, they have a plan in place that they may, that they need to follow. Um, most and within that, there is a requirement to post that um, wearing masks is required. That's part of the um, protocol that was put out by the county. So each of the businesses are supposed to have a sign that says you must wear your mask to come to enter. Um, and then as our city manager stated, we did go around this week and um, it was actually yesterday and today handing out to the businesses to the restaurants. And I can take that to the next step. We've actually posted on our website as well, those safety protocols that we've put in place because um, just so that it's easy for staff and members of the public to, to see by seeing an X under a table that um, restaurants are adequately facing their tables. 
Um, they, we've also requested to ensure that they have signs up for wearing a mask on entry and also to require that all of their staff people are wearing masks as well. And then um, for lining up, also we've asked for, um, the businesses to put down tape or some type of visual cue for um, a, a vis visual um, through tape or chalk to show that they're queuing correctly and keeping parties six feet apart or having the option of um, having a hostess who will take down a phone number and um, suggest that any patrons continue to walk and then c come back to the establishment if there's not available arrows for queuing to come back once they've been called once their table is ready. And Council Member's story, um, if I could just add to that, I, th I'm not sure if this was built into your question or not, but the order is a little confusing, but the way I read it is that social distancing requirements are still in place, but restaurants or businesses just don't have to post them and they don't have to, put, they don't have to fill out or post them on the form that the state initially circulated. Yeah, I thank you, Sam. I I actually read that in the order, but it, that was a bit. It seems contradictory to me um, to say that these are required, but you don't have to tell people that they're required, which is I think creating some of the disconnect down in the village. But yeah, thanks for that clarification. All right. Uh, looks like Councilmember Bertrand has a question. I do. Um, so I noted a lot of enthusiasm when the stanchions were put out and the ropes were put out, and, and I saw Sean uh, working with um, BIA people. But I was wondering. Um, I was wondering. Can you, Jamie, give us a better idea of how many people from staff and what they actually did? You, you made some mentions, um, mostly community development. I, I kind of like a shout out to all those that did work and supported the BIA. Boy, that's a good question. I'm going to miss somebody if I try to think about it. <clears throat> um, Katie, you want to go through your staff? And Steve, you can acknowledge the folks on Public Works that have played a role here? Sure. Um, so. Thank you. So within, uh, we'll start with Public Works. So the Public Works team overall, I think everybody contributed. Um, a few days before, it was earlier in the week, I'm going to guess about last Wednesday or so, that they began bringing out the benches. So the Public Works team placed all the benches around the village to section off different areas. Um, and then on Friday, it was really an all hands on deck. Uh, effort down in the village with uh, Danielle U. Harriet um, kind of leading the effort to let's get out and work in the field and go door to door to these businesses um, from our staff. Um, we had folks from Public Works. The BIA was up in our yard putting together the stanchions with the posts, pouring cement and staining. And <laughs> as they were as they were ready to go, we had Public Works folks bringing the stanchions um, down to the village. I know that there was, uh, many of the businesses were involved in the village, especially the Capitola Candy, um, the Capitola Wine Bar, and building these stanchions and spending multiple days working on that. Um, so all of Public Works was busy, as well as our planners. Um, Sean was instrumental in helping go door to door to the businesses as well as any time we had a free moment, you could see him moving stanchions out in the field and lining things up. Matt Orbach was back in the office helping print off paperwork as it came in and delivering it to us in the field. Um, our building official, Robin Woodman, was instrumental in making and helping guide how the ramps had to be designed. So it was really a um, collaborative effort and Nels Westman, a, uh, local Capitolian who was worked in the building industry for years. He was he volunteered and made all of the ramps for the businesses. I think there are about 10 in total, and I, I hear there's more demand out there. Um, so it was truly, uh, and the public works director, 
Steve Jesford was down in the field as well, helping out. Um, so just a, a great collaborative effort by all. And it never. Katie, I appreciate that. And I want to just take a moment also. It would really have never happened without Katie. She was really the the quarterback driving all this and coming up with the ideas and pulling everybody together. So big kudos, Katie, for uh -huh. for getting this thing done. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. Um, so, Vice Mayor Brooks, did you have a question or did I come to you already? And no, I have a question. Um, hold on, I have a five-year-old in my ear. I'm so sorry. Um, there you go. Um, we've received several emails regarding safety, and I know Councilmember Story asked a few questions about that. Um, what other additional protocols um, other than the banner are we able to implement to ensure that folks can be safe out there are there has there anything um has there anything been in addition to the banner that has been discussed yet and then my second question or my my follow-up to that is when will the bia um, be reporting out we ask that they come back monthly and um when will that be on the agenda so I'll take your second part first. The BIA will be on the agenda next meeting, um, and it'll be on a general gov, <clears throat> and they'll be presenting their work plan and their budget for next year. So I think that's a good opportunity to get a report on how this is going. Um, and then the second piece of the puzzle, we we have been working with First Alarm uh, to get First Alarm out um, on the Esplanade to try to help with the beach closure uh, enforcement, because frankly, if people aren't, if we don't have people there on the beach enforcing it during the closure period, if you leave for 15 minutes, there's 100 people on the beach. Um, so the only way we've been able to get even substantial compliance has been by literally having somebody there. So we have been contracting with First Alarm for the last four or five days to have them help our officers to try to keep the beach actually closed. Terry, I don't know if. Uh, Chief McManus, if you have anything to add in terms of our efforts to try to help with social distancing and compliance in the village, it's it's certainly it's not an easy thing. You know, people people um, you know people don't follow the rules. We can't be nannies for everyone, and it's certainly a challenge. Yeah, thank you, um, Jamie, for the opportunity, and, and you touched on a lot of them. Worth repeating, I think the banners are going to be effective. That was uh, a good idea, bringing those forward. So we look forward to those um, being up soon. Uh, the BIA's role specifically in gaining compliance in their establishments, we think it will go a long way as long as they remain proactive and have personal need to, as Katie mentioned, to fulfill that role. <clears throat> the security component that we just started on Saturday uh, is working out really well. A little bit of um, disruption on, on Saturday because of the tragedy that all of you have spoken of for the sheriff's office. And I want to thank you for your for your kind words uh, uh, with regard to that, that tragic uh, death of, of Sergeant Cutsula. Um But security is working well. Uh, we're, we're having a little bit of a struggle in making sure that we get the staffing that we need, preferably three bodies, three officers. Uh, but they're pretty thin right now with all the requests throughout the county for their services, so we're working through that. And, and then in addition to the village and um, along the Esplanade, as we go forward with more outdoor dining, more of the establishments open, opening up, we have committed to a, a level of foot patrol that we think is going to be required, uh, certainly uh, on the front side and then throughout, to just engage with the public to monitor the vehicle flow and to monitor the pedestrian flow. Uh, we do have the ability and we will, based upon our monitoring, temporarily close the esplanade of vehicles if it gets to a point where there's too many vehicles and too many pedestrians, uh, in addition to the dining, that's uh, just a little bit too dangerous. We have the ability, we've done it uh, over the last couple months a few times, to slow, close down the esplanade to clear the vehicles. Uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to monitor that, uh, the sergeants will. And then regular, and I want to mention uh, all the people that we've talked about, all of you have talked about props uh, to all of those. I want to make, uh, particularly mention a couple of my staff. Of course, the officers, our role is to, to maintain uh, a level of compliance and, and enforcement as required if we go all the only one to talk about. And specifically, Captain Dowley has been designated between our department and the BIA, as well as the ad hoc committee led by Rich Hill. Uh, 
uh, with regard to police um, enforcement posture and our role going forward. Just want to make mention of, of Andy's goal. Uh, and then Sarah Ryan, Sergeant Sarah Ryan, who you all know as well, uh, has been for many years the liaison with the uh, restaurants and the businesses and bars in the village, specifically from an ABC angle, but also as it relates to these changes that are going forward for our villages. So those two, in addition to all their other duties, are doing quite a bit of work to try and make this as best we can. Hope that answers your questions. All right. It looks like we don't have any additional council questions. So with that, we will bring this item uh, to public comment. So now is the time for any member of the public to address the council on uh, this item specifically. And there's the, oh, all right. No? Okay. I do not see anyone with a hand up at this time. Okay. Oh, I see, uh, I see it looks like Karin has her hand up now. Yes, let me, Karin, I'll unmute you, allow you to talk. Okay, um, can you hear me now? We can yep. hear you, Karin. Okay, um, I just want to, uh, a couple of things. I want to uh, thank the uh, city, um, especially Public Works and uh, Planning for really um, busting their butts to hurry this thing along. Um, and also the, the people in the BIA that volunteered all the labor, um, to get things done quickly. And I'm hoping that the restaurants follow suit and, and get their tables out there quickly too, because I think it's gonna, going to look really well. Um, on the, the subject of uh, compliance and our visitor compliance, um, it's terrible. And uh, a lot of areas are not uh, requiring masks at all. And what we have found, um, in, in particular in my store is that we had uh, catchy, you know, we had a colorful little sign with catchy graphics, please wear face covering, sanitize your hands, and, you know, did nothing. We have now gone to, you know, 72 point font, black on white, sanitize your hands, wear face coverings before entering, four signs in the front door, a table they have to walk around with hand sanitizer on it, and believe me, they'll still scoot around that table and we have to point it out to them. So any graphics that we do in the future, I hope will be extremely bold um, because people just are completely unaware. And you know, the, the statistic out there is if 65% of the population wear face masks, the virus will die out. That's, that's you know, a big goal, but um, you know, I just think we have to stress that more than anything else. And I think that when the, when when residents please, when you see restaurants that are that are violating that aren't having people wear their, their to wear their masks till they're seated at the table, and I think that everybody should advise the city if they are seeing anybody that, that is not doing following the proper po protocol. And I hope the city will write letters to these people telling them that they have to because it's our lives out there and. Um, you know, it, you know, I know you know, and I'm just asking the city to be tough with the businesses. Um, and I appreciate, I appreciate everything you've done so far. Um, oh, that's a good graphic. Cool. Yeah, that's good. Mask up for Capitola. I love it. Face covering saves lives. Perfect. Thank you so much. Over and out. Thank you, Karen. Um, let's see, it doesn't look like there's any additional public comments from the public. I don't see any, and I don't see any emails either. Okay. All right. So we will, let me mark it that we went to public comment. Okay. Uh, we will move on to council comment. Uh, I would just like to, to first say thank you to all the staff and all their hard work they've done on this. Um, and it's, it's just thank you so much for all the hard work you've done in supporting our businesses and getting these um, applications done administratively. You've just all put in so much work. And I also want to acknowledge um, all the work of the members of the BIA. Um, I'm sure there's more work that went on behind the scenes than even I saw, but I will tell you that last weekend when I went for a walk at 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, Karen and Rodney from Capitola Candy Company were down there loading uh, uh, 
soil and flowers and setting it all up um, at eight o'clock in the morning, and, and um, it was it was very impressive. So thank you to to the BIA also. This was truly a, a community effort to make this all work. Um, so we'll move on to other council comments. I see that Council Member Story has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Actually, I was going to try to um, ask Karen a question. Um, I don't know if she's still there, but um, maybe this is a question and a comment. Um, I, I think it would be a great opportunity or, or a great, um, you know, service if some of the businesses or one could actually sell masks um, at an inexpensive price so that uh, a lot of people, you know, maybe they come, they don't have them, but when they see the signage that there's a supply of them or we can point to one of the merchants, uh, that may be able to sell them. And so, um, Karn, if you're there, um, maybe you could um, um, you know, use that opportunity or maybe the staff could make that suggestion to some of the merchants to, uh, you know, get the mask out there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Story. Um, I do know, I know that some of our merchants are selling masks um, like cloth masks, and I know that Capitola Liquor on the corner of uh, Stockton and Capitola sells a, um, a pack of 10 for $13, I think it is, or something along those lines. But that's a, that's a great idea, ensuring that there's opportunities for those who don't have masks to get them so they can be in compliance. Uh, Councilmember Bertrand, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a little comment. Um, I was just wondering, maybe it's a question for Steve. Um, I was talking to a couple of merchants. Uh, we did steam cleaning on the sidewalks, but one comment was uh, it wasn't done in front of the Brit, and I don't know if Lower Monterey is, is getting steam cleaned, so maybe they missed it, or I'm just wondering about that. And in general, the whole idea of the streets being cleaned up, I think you know we're trying to put our best foot forward, and you know I hope that we can do uh, more in that regard, uh, work with the BIA and maybe our uh, streets guys uh, could help out too. I'm not sure how that's being attended to. So those are my two questions, steam cleaning and general cleanup around the village. Good evening, Mayor and Councilmember Bertrand. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, good. Um, so we did do some steam cleaning when we initially put the benches out uh, in front of the restaurant. Uh, we did that last Thursday and the bridge at that time had set up anything in front of their restaurant or the other places um, and then this week has been dedicated to the beach and trying to get that grading done so we will be returning next week i talked with the, the owner of britannia arms we are going to try and clean that area up generally we're continuing our cleaning this week's been a little different because of the beach work but we will be doing our regular uh driving the street sweeper through blowing it out and doing what we can to keep it clean. The, behind the benches where the restaurants are, that's gonna become their responsibility to keep that clean. There's no way for us to get in there uh, with any of the equipment. So once they take it over, um, it's gonna become theirs to, to maintain. That's great, thanks Steve. And you know, it's really great to see the uh, sand being groomed, starting that process. I do want to add, though, and, and Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I do believe that our normal contract um, for steam cleaning, sidewalk cleaning, was cut this year uh, as part of our budget cuts. Um, so the level and the amount of cleaning that I think we're going to be seeing this summer is not what we would have seen in the past. I want everyone to be prepared for that, uh, along with our contract with Hope Services for the trash pickup. So we will do what we can, but... And everyone needs to be aware that these budget cuts don't come without um, some implications. So I just wanted to add that. And Steve, please correct me if I'm if I'm misremembering the budget. No, those, uh, those statements are correct. Those items were cut in the budget. Thanks for that clarification, Jamie. All right, Vice Mayor Brooks also has her hand up. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, so my my comment is regarding the cleanup. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is required by the county in terms of like what really gets rid of the virus. So I would be interested in seeing if that is, a, is even a necessity in terms of like what should be actually done to kill the virus. Um, maybe Steve, you could speak to that now or maybe bring that information back on the protocols that 
that would allow for this virus to be killed. You know, if it's if it's living on tables, then is it then of course you would have to, to disinfect it. But I know some some new information has come out, so I'd be interested in hearing more about that. Are you are you asked? Oh, Steve, do you want to take this? Well, I can tell you in, in the bathrooms, we do have, uh, especially the Esplanade bathroom uh, protocol and disinfectants that we use there. On the street, I'm, I have to admit, I'm not aware of any protocols or cleaning techniques for killing the virus uh, on sidewalks and streets. Uh, we are, the cleanup we do is mainly trying to keep the sand and trash levels under control. Uh, that's our primary focus during the week and during the summer in the beach environment. Um, I'd be happy to investigate whether there's more we could do regarding uh, killing the virus on the streets and if there's a protocol for that. Yeah, I just didn't want it to get mixed up in terms of like the cleaning, the like uh, our our city manager stated, you know, that we're making we're those cuts, we're making those cuts. Um, but if it, I didn't want to get those two things confused. Yeah, I, I think the cuts are, are, you know, the health services did trash pickup uh, along the Esplanade and the beaches. Uh, public works crews will be will, will be picking up that as much as we can. The cuts to uh, steam cleaning the sidewalk is something that uh, we we don't have the equipment because we have to recycle the water to do that. Um, but that is something that I don't think that's a, a COVID-19 issue as much as a, a cosmetic issue. Thank you. Also, Member Bertrand, did you have your hand raised for a second time for comments or is that from last time? No, I'm trying to, I hit the wrong button. I'm trying to regain control of my computer. So no, I did not. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Rothworth has his hand up. I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. All right. Uh, motion from Councilmember Bosworth. Uh, second from Vice Mayor Brooks. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Bosworth. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to item 8b uh, fiscal year consideration of fiscal year 2021 budget and capital improvement program for the city of capitola and we'll move it to uh pass this over to staff you're, you're muted jim oh there you go yes got it thank you mayor um and council hello again i'm going to start sharing my screen i have a couple of slides to share with you one proposed budget and just to give you a, a catch up on how we got here today uh, the proposed budget was distributed on May 1st we've had uh, six meetings actually started just before the first three uh, finance advisory committee meetings on April 28th May 5th and again this past Tuesday additionally we've had three city council budget hearings on May 6th May 21st and last week we did a special meeting on June 3rd and at the uh, May 21st meeting council provided direction to return tonight with a resolution for budget adoption um, to recap the budget revisions from the may 21st meeting as council directed we are now utilizing 14,800 of early childhood and youth restricted tot revenue for recreation programming that's going to be allocated based on needs in those four, four categories listed there scholarships supplies transportation and contracts from our special meeting on June 3rd, council gave us additional direction to increase public works contract services by 17,000 in the current fiscal year 2019-20 and additional 26,000 in fiscal year 2021. And that is for closing the creek, grading the lagoon, and then doing the required creek monitoring once we have the creek closed off. 
And in order to cover those costs, uh, council gave further direction to transfer $43,000 from the Park Avenue sidewalk uh, capital improvement project to the general fund. And we're able to do that because we anticipate that project coming in about $54,000 under budget. Uh, a couple of different uh, additional budget revisions since the May 21st meeting is we've added in a recreation event budget. This is for food truck events, which increased our recreation revenue by 14000 which consists of 9000 in sponsorships. And it also increased the recreation expenditures by about 12500 The thought, um, we've had that budget kind of sitting there for a while, and the thought to adding it at this point is, if, uh, if and when those events are allowed, it takes about a month to get those going, and as we get into our summer, summer schedule, we could be delayed quite a bit. Um, what I can commit to is that when those events are allowed, we will not put on an event until we've secured enough in sponsorships to cover the cost. So the goal is to be revenue and cost neutral on the food truck events at this point. Um, we also updated the liability insurance. I got the final premium amount from Foundation, and it was about almost $6,300 less than what I had uh, estimated. Uh, cleaning up the community grants, I had a bad number in the, in the last budget, but um, what I wanted to, to demonstrate is we all are aware we've cut the community grant programming for fiscal year uh, 2021, but with the plan is to return the community grant program to full funding of 275000 as we did last year with uh, 249500 coming from the general fund and 25500 coming from early childhood and youth restricted TOT revenues. I've also cleaned up the contingency reserve. So in the last draft, you saw a transfer from contingency of 165000 uh, through some of the uh, other amendments that we made prior to May 21st, we no longer need that transfer. But I do still show uh, a transfer of 800, a little over 879,000 in balance out fiscal year 21-22. We had uh, talked about not including that this year just because there's so many unknowns, but our, our uh, fiscal management policies require that we do a proposed as well as a plan. So as of right now, I need to show that that's valid, so that's why that transfer is there. Um, we will not be presenting a proposed budget next spring that far out of balance. That's just kind of balancing it out right now until we get more information to get that number tighter. On uh, general fund and reserves, so our fiscal year 2021 operating budget is balanced. We're estimating beginning the year July 1st uh, with about $154,000 in the general fund. We have programmed about $141,000 of that into um, different expenditures throughout the year with an estimated ending fund balance on June 30th of 2021 of about 13500 And again, um, I mentioned, I don't think I have a slide on it, but we'll be coming back to the council at a minimum on a quarterly basis as we get uh, TOT and sales tax revenue. So those numbers will tighten up each time and uh, make sure that everybody's fully aware of where we're sitting on the fund balance. Jim, on can the you reserve, speak up? Jim, can you speak up? I didn't hear that last part. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry. Um, I just had said that we will be coming back to the council at a minimum on a quarterly basis, and each time we do, we'll update where our fund balance position is at that time. Um, on the reserve balances, our contingency currently has a little over $2 million. Our emergency reserve, um, $1.36 million, $1 million. And our PERS contingency, that's an April 30th balance. Um, I was going to tell you that it's probably significantly higher, or a little bit higher than that, but the market took a little dive today, so that's probably a pretty close balance at 889. So as far as key dates and follow-up items, uh, sales tax revenue is the one that we'll, we will be watching even closer this year than we normally do. And the key dates, the first one is August 20th. We will learn what the amount is of our final fourth quarter fiscal year 1920 payment is, which is the quarter we're in now, so on August 20th we'll receive notification from the state on what our sales tax total is for the quarter. And then on November 20th, we'll find out what that amount is for the first quarter of fiscal year 2021, which is July through September. Um, and then we will be coming back to council and updating council on those numbers as they come through. TOT, we received the 10th of each month, um, which was yesterday, and I can tell you it's a little better this month than last month, but it, pretty low as uh, hotels and motels are, 
are really just going to start opening up uh, tomorrow, I believe, uh, officially. Um, the other revenue item we'll be watching is the cannabis tax. This is a new revenue source for the city. We had thought that it would kick in uh, January 1st of this year. It took a little bit longer, but our first retail store opened in April and actually got their second cannabis tax payment today. And then Deep Thought, the second store, is still scheduled to open in the fall, so we'll be keeping an eye on that and making sure our estimates on that are, are close. And then, as always, CalPERS costs. Uh, we will get our actuarial reports come out in August. And I don't have it on a slide, but I grabbed some data. <coughs> so um, what we'll be watching is I don't anticipate a big jump in our UAL, or not, it is a big jump, but not an unexpected jump. Uh, CalPERS told us last year that next year's UAL, fiscal year 21-22, will go up by about 13.5% from the 1,750 that it's at this year, fiscal year 2021, going up to 1,983. And then they have estimated that we will see an increase in fiscal year 22-23 of about 8%, taking us up to 2.1 million. That's the one I'm going to really be watching because the, the numbers are driven off of um, CalPERS performance as of June 30th of this year. So we'll be watching that. And it, We'll have kind of a two-year advance warning, but um, I'm anticipating that number to be quite a bit larger than what the original estimates were. Uh, as far as recommended action, uh, the recommended action is to approve the resolution adopting the fiscal year 2021 operating budget and capital improvement program, and direct staff to cancel the special city council meeting budget hearing next Wednesday, June 18th. And that completes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jim. Uh, council members, are there any questions on this item? I see Vice Mayor Brooks has her hand up. Yes, thank you, Mayor Peterson. I was hoping that Katie could um, speak to the CDBG CV grants that we're getting. Um, she mentioned it earlier, but I think it may be more applicable at this time to discuss um, those incoming funds and she mentioned something about three, the three uh, waves of the dollars come in. Thank you, Councilmember Brooks. Um, this is Katie Hurley, the Community Development Director. And yes, um, I've been working closely on the CDBG grants, and we passed a resolution um, last month um, over the, the course of two meetings towards how we were going to utilize the CDBG funds for different activities. So I'm sorry I don't have a slide for you, but what we have for CDBG funds, we have 80,000 that's going to be in this first round of funding. And then we also have 88,000 in program income. So for the first round of CDBG grant funds that can be used towards um, COVID-19, we have $168,000 to work with. This is the first round of CDBG funds, and there'll be two more rounds. They're anticipating the second round to be larger amounts than the first round. So the $80,000 that we're getting in this first round, they're anticipating the second round will be larger. The third round, I have no expectations of what the amount will be. Um, and the second round is supposed to happen soon. So they're saying um, that funding should follow pretty pretty closely after this first round. Um, what, we, what we decided during our initial resolution was to fund public services, which is made up of housing assistance. So um, rental assistance can be covered in that, as well as food. So different um, nonprofits or entities that provide food services to the public. CDBG funding has to be tied to low and moderate income households. So there's a tie back there. Um, also, the other activities that we put in place was housing facilities for the homeless and economic development. The fourth category, health care facilities, does not apply to Capitola. That would be if, say, we had transferred um, Jade Street into a COVID-19 um, medical facility. That Luckily, we haven't had that experience here. So the three. Um, activities are public services, um, housing facilities for the homeless, and economic development. 
And during our recent meeting that we had with our, uh, or our recent uh, ad hoc group meeting, which comprised of the mayor and vice mayor, um, the two items that we'll be focusing on for this first grant distribution is public services. So again, that's your housing assistance and food, as well as economic development. Thank you. You're welcome. And the, the we'll be making, we'll, we'll be publicizing um, for the food portion of that to have groups come in and um, for the public service portion of that to let us know if they're interested in providing those services to Capitola. And I think during our initial public comment period, we did hear some interest in that. So that will be happening shortly. It's not posted on our website yet. We're working out um, first, uh, we're focused on getting our application in to the state, but we'll also be posting that as we're waiting for funds to come in. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see, any additional questions from the council? Seeing none, uh, we will now open public comment for this item, and I will pass it over to our, where'd my pen go? And I will pass it over to our moderator, uh, Larry, to uh, call on those who would like to address the council on this item. Uh, you will have three minutes to speak. Uh, and I will uh, rely on our staff in chambers to uh, keep our time for us. Mayor Peterson, we have a couple of comments so far. Um, Raymond Consino is first. You Thank you, Council. Appreciate your time. Uh, and pretty interesting to see a city council on Zoom. I always enjoy uh, these things because it's a different perspective. It almost seems like you guys are the Brady Bunch on my screen. So. Um, just wanted to uh, first uh, thank you all for your continued efforts. Uh, I know this is a very difficult time in which uh, you are trying to balance the budget. Uh, my concern lies in really um, a lack of conversation around uh, increasing revenue opportunities that could be helping to offset uh, the unfortunate and devastating uh, budget cuts to social service funding and critical uh, funded essential services in our community. Um, so I'd like you to consider uh, proposing a very similar uh, proposal that we've been working on with the city of Santa Cruz of increasing a parking um, amount of close to a dollar additional an hour uh, and making that in isolation uh, specifically for social service programming that helps support the citizens of, Santa, of, uh, uh, of Capitola. Um, I think it's an opportunity for you to look at your revenues and your parking revenues in a different way and look at that as an opportunity for increased revenue generation. Uh, the second point I'd like to um, uh, point out is that I, I, I understand um, everyone's prior comments saying that these decisions aren't easy and they're not, um, you know, taken lightly. Uh, I do want to point out, though, that it's really hard when the record states, um, you know, a, a funding action uh, to support a museum that is essentially losing $45,000 a year. Um, not only is the total revenue uh, for the museum, $7,000 made up of fundraising and only $2,600 of box revenue. It shows um, that unfortunately your priorities are for museums instead of food for seniors, transportation for seniors, health care for, um, for families, child care for families, and support services and the well-being of our community. That, that is just what the record is stating based on the budget approval you have in front of you. In addition to that, you have over $35,000 in art and events uh, of contracts to contractors to do events and public activities that are important. But I still go back to the question of, is that more important than taking care of our seniors that have built this community? Is that more important than taking care of the moms and the fathers and the families that are potentially at risk of eviction? Um, those are the questions that I would ask. And if I was in your seat, Unfortunately, I would disagree with you and I would be making a different decision. So um, thank you for your consideration. Uh, I look forward to further conversations where we could look at revenue generation and not just cuts and uh, look at that as an opportunity for us to be partners to try to 
rally the troops and have the community discussion in order for us to take advantage of what Capitola has, which is it's a destination. Everybody across the world wants to come to Capitola, and it's really an opportunity for us to take advantage of it. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Larry? Yes, we, we have uh, the last number of 854. Yes, hi. Thank you very much. Um, good evening again, Mayor and City Council members. This is Lisa Berkowitz, uh, Community Bridges Meals on Wheels. And I want to thank you for all the past support you've provided for Capitola Seniors. Your help has made a tremendous difference in the, so many lives. And I understand and I know that the decisions you're having to consider regarding funding are extremely difficult. Um, during more normal times, Meals on Wheels is out there fighting food insecurity and social isolation for Capitola seniors. And in these extraordinary times of COVID-19, the essential services that Meals on Wheels provides have taken on an even more critical role with seniors being advised to stay at home to protect their health and life. Um, many of the calls to start new service for Capitola seniors were from folks who had called on Meals and Wheels in the past to help them out. Um, they knew by simply picking up the phone and making that call to Meals on Wheels that we would be there to deliver meals. No questions asked and regardless of their ability to donate towards the cost of the meals, they knew they could count on Meals on Wheels. The past few months have been very tough and many a phone call has ended with a senior in tears and a heartfelt thank you for knowing that meals would be delivered. Um, our dedicated staff and our amazing volunteers didn't hesitate uh, to take on the challenge in the high risk environment we find ourselves in. Countywide, we're serving thousands more meals to hundreds of new seniors since the shelter in place began. At the end of February, we were serving an average of 395 seniors home delivered meals. We are now serving over 650 seniors. By the end of June, we'll have served over 5,500 meals to isolated Capitola seniors, almost all of them living alone, with the youngest senior being 66 and the oldest senior being 93 years young. So Capitola seniors depend on us to be there to provide meals uh, delivered to them when needed and Meals on Wheels depends on funders like the City of Capitola to help bridge the funding gap. So on behalf of the seniors, we, I respectfully request that you consider revising the recommendations for the complete elimination of funding for next fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I've got Karen Delaney. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I was really moved to hear the passion at the beginning of this meeting and really the anguish over what we're faced with. I too am committed in this moment to talking about not settling, to doing things differently. If, if we really want to make a pivot on equity and racism, it requires us to live with our discomfort and to put our personal feelings and actions aside and be courageous enough to look at the data and be judged by the impact of our results, not by our words. And so I want to say when I look at not the words, but a budget is an expression in numbers of our priorities and what next year's budget of capitola is communicating clearly every single function of government is a higher priority than the needs of not all residents but some residents the usual suspects who are always moved to the back of the bus i hear words about we have no choice because of the circumstances we are in. And yet there are four city budgets. I've read all four of them in the exact same climate. 
and two, are making a very different choice. Only Capitola and Scotts Valley are saying to those people that always get sent to the back of the bus, no money for you. So what does that say about Capitola that those are the inarguable facts? I hear that Capitola is in a unique situation. From a data point of view, there are two big ways that Capitola and Scotts Valley are unique in local jurisdictions. One is they're wealthier. They're the wealthier of the two four, of the four cities. And you have healthier reserves. And yet the other two cities who have poorer residents and less reserves are coming to a radically different values-based decision than you are asked to do. What does that say about us? What does that say about Capitola? What does that say to the residents you're saying next year, go to the back of the bus, get off the bus, be thrown under the bus? I pray that we do that. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate it. Larry, are there any additional? It doesn't look like there's any additional uh, public comments on the Zoom meeting anyways. I, I don't see any other hands raised. We do have a few comments from email. I, w I will try and get those going via shared screen. Uh, okay. Give me a, it's always fun. So let's give it a shot. Um, You see that screen? Oh wait, I'm sorry. Um, I have to, sorry. Okay, we will try the uh, audio. I simply want to speak on behalf of our families and children receiving counseling, survivors of child sexual abuse, seniors struggling through this crisis with issues of aging, callers to our suicide prevention hotline, residents of care facilities isolated and at great risk of infection and women fighting cancer who are already medically compromised. Why would you completely abandon them at this hour and under these conditions? We can't be partners in serving Capitola residents only in the good times. We understand the magnitude of the fiscal challenges faced by the city. We ask that you share the reductions and do not defund community programs and thus shift the burden of serving your vulnerable residents to someone else. David Bianchi, Executive Director, Family Service Agency of the Central Coast, 104 Walnut Avenue, Suite 208, Santa Cruz, California, 95060, 831-4239444, Four. Okay, I will try and share the next one. Leah Samuels, Executive Director of the Human Care Alliance here. I hope you all received, read, and considered the letter we sent. It appears you still intend to make a complete cut to the grant funding historically provided to nonprofits and matched by federal funds. To add to that letter, I wanted to refer you to a study in 2018 conducted by a sociologist at NYU and cited by numerous others, including the Brennan Center for Justice and the New York Times. Research found that in a city of 100,000 that each new nonprofit community organization lead to a 1.2% drop in the homicide rate, 1% drop in violent crimes, and 0.7% reduction in property crime. The study concluded, and I hope you consider, that crime reduction is difficult without addressing problems stemming from chronic poverty. We have all enjoyed a five years of declining crime in Santa Cruz County. I hope you will do your part to keep that going. 
what communities like Capitola do right now to address inequities in funding and demonstrate how they view public safety will be critical to achieving unity in our currently fractured country. Thank you for your time. Best. Leah Samuels. Human Care Alliance. Executive Director. Dear Capitola City Council, please consider my comments as my input regarding proposed budget cuts for social services, as well as CDBG funds. I work for Community Bridges as the CHRO and have worked at Community Bridges for 27 years because of the variety of vital services our agency provides to so many in the community, including the frail and elderly. Our Elder Day Adult Day Care program supports numerous families to provide vital services to frail and elderly community members, which in turn helps the families that are involved to keep them employed and prevent caregiver burnout, as well as improve the lives of our participants keeping them from nursing homes or worse likely out of the county. Please prioritize these social service and CSBG funds for programs such as Elder Day, Meals on Wheels and all the other important family resource and nutrition programs that Community Bridges provides. I know that Mr. Story has supported our mission for years and intimately knows how important it is to fund such life-changing services to our community. We appreciate his support and would ask for your support as well to support our mission and vision. We have 200 dedicated employees who work tireless hours to provide these much-needed services each day. Thank you for your consideration and support up front. Respectfully, Julie. Julie Ray Gilbertson, PHR, SHRMCP. Chief Human Resources Officer, Community Bridges. Yep. So it looks like this is the, the same as before. Should I, should I read it? Or I think it's the same message as we had before. Yeah, it looks like the same one. At this time, I do not see any other emails, any other public comment emails at this time. Great. All right. Uh, thank you. With that, we'll close public comment on this item and bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. Um, I would like to start by saying thank you to those who have commented and, and reached out. We certainly hear your concerns and understand them. Uh, I'd like to share some information and also address some of, of what was mentioned in public comment. Um, Capitola of the four cities, as mentioned, um, has the smallest budget of all of the four cities in this county. And I think that that's one of the things that we really need to consider is that other cities have different opportunities within their budget that we as a smaller city do not have. Um, we have to make difficult decisions. And I know that as mentioned, no one wants to hear that, that these are difficult decisions because when our difficult decisions aren't necessarily um, in any one uh, organization or community's benefit, then it seems like it wasn't a difficult decision that we have, as one commenter said, thrown people under the bus. Um, several of us on council have worked for nonprofit agencies or served on their boards and still do. And um, to be quite honest, it's frustrating to hear the suggestion that we simply don't care about those in our community and that we're throwing them under a bus. These are very difficult uh, decisions. In fact, if I remember correctly, I don't remember if it was last fiscal year or the one before that Capitola was the only city to provide uh, a COLA adjustment in our community grant program. And uh, I can be fact checked on this one, but if I remember correctly, we are also one of the cities that provides the largest uh, percentage compared to our small budget in our community uh, grants program. So we have always been committed to this and we remain so. And it unfortunately is just that we have to make the unfortunate and difficult decisions this year. That being said, as mentioned by uh, several of our uh, uh, public commenters and, and those in the community that I've discussed this with, we are receiving CDBG CB grant funding through the CARES Act. There will be three rounds of that funding, and with the total of those three rounds, we will potentially be able to, to provide more to community programs than we ever would have been able to with our typical budget. Now, that won't necessarily go to all of the same organizations or in the same way, but we are committed to ensuring that the funding that we do receive in those um, CARES Act funds and the CDBG uh, funds through the CARES Act, rather, 
uh, will go back to our community to address those that are most uh, vulnerable to uh, in this experience of COVID-19 and those most directly impacted by it. So please, if the idea is that we are just going to cut our funding and do nothing to try to assist, uh, I ask that you, you please uh, reconsider that mindset because we are doing what we can with what we have where we are right now. Um, with that, I will move on to other council members. Uh, if anyone has any comments, and then we will um, deliberate and go to a vote. Do any other members of the council have uh, any comments? I am not seeing any, if there aren't any. Oh, there's two of Jacques now. That's interesting. Okay, uh, Ed, we'll go to Ed, and then to Sam. Uh, council member Rob Twerf, and then to council member Story. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I, I think you expressed the, uh, what I feel to be the opinion of the council very eloquently. Um, you know, I, it, 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 this is something I've never had to deal with. I, you know, uh, all my years on the council, uh, as you mentioned, Capitola has been generally uh, very generous with uh, giving the community grants. Um, I think we've tried to help as many as possible. Uh, but the, the concept of trying to pick and choose right now what is a priority I mean, we're looking at you know trying to deal with our employees services possible layoffs uh you know this is real it's affecting everybody uh the decision we made uh, to, to, to uh, keep the museum open for thirteen thousand dollars i think it was very difficult for us but i but what i fall back on is is you know we we here represent ten thousand people in this town and we try to all bring to the table what we feel matters to the community. And I think that, uh, you know, they're the ones that are paying the property taxes. They're the ones that are contributing the largest portion of the money into our revenue. And so I, I think we owe it to them to try to make sure that we, you know, listen to what they want us to do. And even though over the years they've given great direction for us to support community grants, uh, closing of the library would be, would be uh, the museum, I'm sorry, the museum, would be something that you know i think that that's not how they want we want us to to vote so i mean i struggle with that you know we we, we struggled again to, to open up junior guard uh and again i think it's something that matters to the community and it doesn't just because something matters to the community doesn't mean that something doesn't matter to the community and and the, and the truth of it is is we just don't have the money to, to even try to, 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 to parcel it out and and i appreciate you mentioning that our budget is the smallest and our revenue, our reserves are definitely in no comparison to the city of Santa Cruz and Watsonville. So um, with that, I'm prepared to make a motion to approve the uh, staff recommendation on the budget. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Jacques, if you're, uh, Council Member Bertrand, if you're speaking, you are muted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. We have a motion. Uh, if, it's, if it's comments about this item, there, of course, uh, we can continue speaking, but right now we have a motion on the floor, so we need either a second or for the motion to die for lack of second, and then we'll continue. Well, I gave the second. Oh, you did. Okay. That's what we didn't hear. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. We'll continue for conversation. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Go, go ahead, Jacques, and then we're going to go to Sam because he had his hand up. Part of our budget. You have to look at it from the standpoint we are trying to support portions of our population that are very critical and the one i'd like to point out is initially we weren't so sure about um junior guard and the the and the activities that we supply uh, supply um, our funds for for kids and so we made that decision that that was a very critical one because kids often don't get that kind of support. And we're sort of swinging over into that. That's led by our newer members on the city council. And it's been long, go it's been long, I think we've, <laughs> we've missed that opportunity. And now we're thinking about that a little bit more. Um, some people criticize our, our support of the museum. Um, the museum has been a very long going organization in Capitola. And most of the members are seniors. It's, it's a sizable number of people. I'm not too sure how many, but you know, close to 100 people. And this is a very important social aspect for the members of that, that part of Capitola. 
So we're doing things on this level and trying to focus on <laughs> people, like Ed said, that are part of Capitola, and we're holding that community tight by supporting the things that we feel are important to them. It is true that we're going to be getting some money through various grants and such like that, and those are being directed to some of the most critical people who don't have homes, some people with just uh, housing uh, challenge, and also delivery for food. So some, sometimes in this particular situation, we're being forced to make choices for people that we feel are very important for the community. And this is Capitol, so it's reflective of who we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. We'll go to Councilmember Story. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, you know, I just wanted um, to explain when the vote comes up and to restate at this time uh, that, um, and so that everyone clearly knows that um, on the community programs aspect of the budget, I am recused from participating in that conversation and in that vote because my wife works for one of the recipient agencies. And therefore, um, I'm viewed to have a financial interest and therefore cannot participate. And, that, and um, so within the context of the motion, which is dealing with the budget as a whole, um, I will approve it but I hope the record will show that I am not making uh, a comment uh, or a statement about the community programs funding and the cuts to that funding. I think if anybody um, knows me and my history uh, in Santa Cruz County, um, they know where my values are. Uh, but I wanted to just state that uh, for the record uh, so that that is clear. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Story. Uh, Councilmember Bottorf, is, do you have your hand up again, or is that left up from last time? I just want to make sure I don't uh, overlook if there's additional comments. Oh, sorry, Mayor, I just heard it Carol. No problem. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. No, I'm sorry. I've, we can carry on with, with the vote. Thank you. OK. Uh, any additional comments from council? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. Uh, motion made by Councilmember Botworf, uh, second by Councilmember Bertrand. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Councilmember, oh, okay. Aye. Thank you. Councilmember Botworf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Um, I am recused on the community program. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We're going to move on to item 8C. Receive. My apologies. We're going to move on to item 8C. Uh, receive community survey results. We have a staff report. We do, give me a second here. So I'm gonna be running this PowerPoint for Gene Bregman. Gene, are you on the line? I am here. Great. Can you all hear me? I can hear you. So we will put this slideshow up. Can you see the slides, Gene? I can, fantastic. Great, all right, Gene, the uh, ball is in your court. Oh, modern technology. Um, hi, everybody, well, council members, mayor. Um, we're going to give you a report today, a survey that we did, as you recall, several weeks ago. Um, expected to do 100, between 150 and 175 interviews during the week after Memorial Day. Um, we did both by phone and, uh, and go through quite a few questions, and, and so I'll try to go through these. Uh, uh, questions afterwards. Um, ah, there we go. 
chart one first question and the question we've asked in the last two polls we did for the city how would you rate capitola as a place to live uh everybody still loves it here 95 and 97 percent now 96 percent there really isn't too much more to say about it except people like living here because it's not as nice um to anybody who knows the area all right chart two the overall job being done by capitola city government in providing services and taking care of the needs of local residents again very high marks uh little change really over these six years excellent good was 78 percent 79 percent 73 percent that's all pretty much the, the the same place if there's any change at all it's a little bit more in the only fair which I, with a drop in a couple of the others but really that's when I mean, you have three quarters of the people uh saying that the city got a good job or an excellent job um you've got a good base of support among your voters chart three uh again there's another study, question we have asked in all three studies what kind of a job is this thing when managing its budget and finances and here you get a lot more people who have no opinion not that they think you're doing a bad job but we have in all three times of it is four percent before but the excellent was 58 53 49 all pretty reasonably close just around half the people at excellent are good slightly more on the no opinion this side this time um the people who um are over the age of 60 are a little more likely to say you're doing an excellent or good job which is always nice right. chart four act summarizes two of the that we uh, the part of these uh charts have just seen plus added the third one we have on top the overall job being done by capital city government excellent or good at 73 percent then the jobs is doing managing the budget of finances that can go 49 and this one which is what kind of the job has the city been doing responding to the coronavirus crisis and again that's just a superb result an excellent good 67 percent um again single digit on poor response you know it follows everything else now that people like living here they like the way that the city is run um just from top to bottom uh, okay next chart we start getting more specific and this one we've only asked the last two surveys is there a need for more money but for the city of capitola in general is there a great need some need a little need or no real need remarkably consistent with what we had four years ago the combined great need and some need 55 percent and 54 percent um a little bit more this time than no opinion than on the no need um less of a response of having a great need or some need among the younger respondents those under the age of 40. Uh, and they come up again in other questions we'll see shortly and then we added three questions asking people on the, the effects of the coronavirus have been first one was how concerned are you with the effects of the coronavirus on the local economy 61 percent say they're very concerned 91 percent were either very or somewhat concerned not two and not all concerned with the other choices then we how concerned with you with the impact of the coronavirus on the health of you and your family very concerned was 42 very somewhat concerned still three quarters of the people were at least somewhat concerned about the health issues personally for them and then the last one was how concerned are you with the impact of the coronavirus on your personal financial situation fewer people are very concerned but still two-thirds were just somewhat concerned not as much as the general concern for the local economy as we saw on top of 61 and 91 but still at 68 percent saying very or somewhat concerned um, it, uh, it's still an issue out there for, for a lot of people um the uh interestingly that the top one the local economy we had 
very concerned was higher among the people with who were over the age of forty and people who are under forty the younger people were a little less often very conservative on the local economy but on the other hand the renters are more concerned with the coronavirus effect on their personal financial situation and then we our last one of the coronavirus questions was uh, well, actually, the next to the last one was what is your personal expectation for your financial situation a year from now? And the plurality people said they'd be about expect to be about the same as it is now. Thirty-one percent thought it would be better. Sixteen percent expected it to be worse. Um, a slight, slightly optimistic group. Um, Two thirds of those over the age of sixty thought it would be about the same. not really terribly surprising. And now here is our, really is our last question, I think, on the effect of the coronavirus. And we asked, with, will the coronavirus uh, be effect, much of an effect, or will, there, will it be on the budgets and services provided by each of these? And we asked for very serious, somewhat not too, or not much at all, uh, effect. 67% thought the effects on the state of California would be very serious. 60% on the county, 58% about the same on the city, and lower for local hospitals and local public schools on the very concerned. Um, now, on the other hand, if you add the somewhat concerned, they're all very high. The, uh, the ones with the lower, very concerned, make up for it with somewhat concerned. Um, and interestingly, people who are the younger people are less likely to say that the effects will be very serious on all of these, younger meaning under 40 in this case. And then we get to our, our, our votes, our first vote. One of the tasks for this poll was to assess how people felt about a utility user's tax um, and we read people a paragraph. I think, council members, you have the actual questionnaire there. Um, similar to what you actually see on the ballot. We started by asking, how would you vote electoral health today on a 7% utility tax? 35% yes. Now, granted, it's only, we only need a half, a um, majority, 50% plus one. Nonetheless, 35% is awfully low. You go up the 5%, we're at 40% saying yes. And we do pass the 50% at a 3% tax, but I would caution uh, everyone to, to take that with a grain of salt or several grains of salt. Because uh, you always, by the time you get to that last vote, there are a certain number of people who are saying yes, either just because it's better than what they've heard before, or just maybe to stop you from asking the question. Um, and so I asked about the five and the three percent only if they hadn't said yes to the seven. They were asked about the three only if they hadn't said yes to the five. These are cumulative totals. Then our next three sets of bars are at the end of the survey after, or later in the survey, after people heard uh, why those support and those that oppose it, about how the programs that would be supported, and now how would you vote? And we actually have a drop off in the seven and five percent, the 31 and 36 percent yeses from the 35 and 40, and still the same at the three percent. But again, you know that that cautionary uh, note reiterate that. Um, generally speaking, in the the, the first. The, the difference is there's a little more support among people over the age of 60 um, and, and, and in the last votes. And there's a little um, less support um, among the younger people, the ones under 40. Now, my, my conjecture is it's just a general tax uh, situation now and the general economic situation is a little more tenuous 
for uh, the younger people than for the older ones. Remember, the older ones, 67% of them thought their economic situation would be pretty stable a year from now. Then, in between those two sets of votes, we had a couple questions. The first question was in chart 10. Next chart. Whoever's moving them along for me. There we go. Um, and we asked people, uh, we gave them this list one at a time, and we rotated it so there was no uh, order bias to it. And he asked if one of these programs that would be supported by the utility tax, very important, somewhat important, not too or not at all important. These percentages are just those who said very important, the top box. And we always look at that because that's the kind of uh, level of, of support that you might see influenced by these items on voters. So the top two were maintaining the city's infrastructure and maintaining the high quality of our police services at 41 and 39%. Um, then it drops down, the rest are all in the 20s, 20 to 29%. Um, uh, four years ago, we had a similar, though not exactly the same list of items. Five of the items were the same. The important point, though, is when we asked this question then, our range was not 20 to 41 as it is today. The range was 37 to 67 percent, saying it was very important for various programs to be supported. And I think that is a direct reflection of last time we were asking about an extension of uh, the sales tax, which people were very supportive of. And here we're asking it, and it's tied to the utility tax which people are not so supportive of. Um, as you would expect, um, people who are opposed to the tax increase are less likely to say any of these are very important. Uh, um, it's interesting, the only one actually maintaining the city's infrastructure was asked in both studies, and those came out to be about the same, but anything else that was asked the same is much lower now than it was uh, four years ago. We then, we then followed this with uh, two questions, and we read paragraphs, which I think you probably have there in front of you. First, well, actually, we rotated them, so half the people saw the reason to support the utility tax uh, first, and half the people were, were read or read, they did online themselves, the reasons to oppose the utility tax first. And we asked in each case, how convincing are these arguments to vote either for or against, as the case may be, uh, very convincing somewhat, or not convincing. And you can see further evidence of, the, uh, of where we are, that the reasons to support only get 58% and only 20% who say they're very convincing, whereas the opposition, 81% say the opposition arguments are convincing reasons to vote in opposition to the utility tax, including 45% who find it very convincing. Um, older people, people without kids, Democrats, uh, homeowners were a little bit more apt to say that the reasons to support were convincing, but we're still in a, in a, a downward end here uh, comparing the two. And then from that, we followed up with the, with the later votes that, uh, that I already saw where the votes actually dropped uh, for the first two utility taxes. So we also wanted to take a look at how people would react to a vote on increasing the sales tax from nine to nine and a quarter percent. Uh, and in this case, 59% say they would vote in favor uh, 36% opposed, 6% undecided. Um, clearly, if, if, if there's a sense that people have a interest or a willing to support something, it certainly would be much more likely on a sales tax increase than a utility tax increase. Um, 
But again, the younger voters are less supportive of this too, and the older voters are more supportive. Um, not surprisingly, people who, who are supportive of the utility tax are also more likely to be of this tax as well. We then follow this with two questions related to three statements about the utility tax and the sales tax and asking it's really sort of comparisons. The first one's the first we see the first ABC, and we ask people, did you generally agree or disagree with each one? Um, and the first one, what it boils down to, says, I prefer the sales tax because it's more fair and equitable than taxing utilities. The second one, B, given the COVID-19 crisis, unemployment, downturn in the economy, we cannot afford any tax increase. And the last one was sort of the, really the rationale for the utility tax, um, which is it's the only one that will really raise enough money to really make a difference in city services and programs. In the agreement side, we had 76% agreed with the argument in favor of a sales tax. Of course, at the same time, 65% also agreed this isn't a good time for a tax. But only 40% agreed with the statement that the utility tax was a, a better way to go. We follow that up, and that's the bottom part of this chart, is asking people to choose which one do they prefer among these three statements. 45% said they prefer the sales tax increase. 11% prefer the utility tax, and 34% said we just can't afford any tax increase now. The good news on this is that you've only got an entrenched 34% who probably won't support anything that you put on the ballot. But you do have a 56% who might be open to supporting something. And then our last question was the last issue that we were asked to hold on, which was opinion of a tax measure, a different tax measure, it's a different, solely dedicated for projects to slow erosion of the bluffs overlooking the ocean, as a general, without putting any kind of specific tax on it, 31% would be in favor, 46% would be opposed. You know, a quarter would have no opinion, but again, not a lot of uh, stomach or interest in, in this tax for just this purpose. So that's about our last chart. I think and it's pretty clear, utility taxes are always very difficult. And that's certainly true here. And I, I could not recommend that you uh, that you go for uh, utility tax even at the lower three percent level. Uh, I think it would be a real uphill battle to try to get that passed. Um, as far as increasing a, a quarter cent increase in the sales tax, um, I'm not sure. And Jamie can talk to that momentarily about the effectiveness of. of of having that in place if it were to pass. You know, we didn't do the kind of detailed research on that question here, but the indications are certainly of a, certainly a lot better chance of passing that than you would have the utility tax. Um, questions? Mayor Peterson, if you'd like, I think I have a couple more slides that I can just talk a little bit about how much money each one of these options raises, if that would be helpful before we go into questions. Sure, we have a council member with their hand raised. Um, should we wait until your, uh, the next couple slides? I'll do it quick. Okay. So very quickly, we polled on three, three questions around the utility tax, the utility tax at 3%, 5%, and 7%. <clears throat> the, this is how much we estimate that it would raise. A 3% utility tax would raise about $700,000 a year, all the way up to a 7% utility tax raising about $1.6 million a year. You can see that in general, the utilities tax split approximately 50-50 from between residential users and commercial users. And then to remind council, uh, this is how much we get from our actual district taxes. You can see it has been relatively flat over time. I think we hit, that was around the high in 16, 17. We've seen 
minor declines since then, and then obviously the impacts from the coronavirus. So um, the district taxes are around at this point, had been around a million dollars, um, looking at mid eights right now with coronavirus and the utility tax at the low end, the 3% is the 700K. And that's, that's all I had. Um, and now um, Gene and I are, are available for questions. All right. Uh, it looks like Council Member Story has his hand raised for questions. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, Gene, I, I was curious um, of the time frame in which you um, made, uh, you know, the calls or, uh, or got the email. I noticed it says May 19th on the results. So. Yeah, well, the May 19th, that, that was the date that we finalized the questionnaire. We actually started interviewing on the 27th. Uh, and then finished up on it was either thirty first or the first. Okay, so basically the end of May. Um, right. When you were contacting folks. Okay. Right. Um, you know, on the sales tax results where it shows that fifty nine percent said yes. Um, has it been your experience that there may be a delta between? How many people may say yes in a poll, but then ultimately will vote yes in um, the privacy of a, of a you know, um, of a ballot um, or, or, or or in the with their vote? Uh, generally speaking, it's based on how good a campaign is run. Um, I mean that that now in this case. Um, I am loath to give you, uh, you know, full steam ahead recommendation because this vote was taken after people spent a bunch of time on the utility taxes they didn't like. So there's a certain amount here of this is better than the other, so I'll vote yes on this. It's hard to quantify that. Um, Nonetheless, I mean, if if the situation is such that you desperately need additional money, even if it's not what you would hope for, um, it might be worth taking a shot at this. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions from council? Seeing hands up. So with that, we'll bring this to uh, public comment. I will turn it over to you, uh, Larry, as our moderator. Uh, Mayor Pearson, I do not see anyone with their hands raised, nor do I see any emails at this time. Okay. Uh, so at this time, we are closing public comment on this item. We'll bring it back to council, and I see Councilmember Botworth has his hand raised. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, well, I, you know, it, it's uh, Gene. I want to thank you for the report. You know, I, I do uh, put a lot of credibility into it. Uh, it's been a good uh, guide uh, in the past, giving us uh, some kind of you know anticipated direction that might go. Although I do remember one uh, uh, COT tax where we scored over 81 percent. And it still failed. And I think the one key comment that you made that resonated with me was it depends how big you campaign. And you've got to keep in mind, we're not really allowed to campaign. I, I think that I, I, I was a self appointed campaign director for almost all the tax initiatives over the last seven years. And uh, it really boils down to the opposition. And I think what's going on, you know, in, in addition to virus, is uh, just a general tax fatigue. Uh, and maybe a lack of uh, trust where the money's going. So you get to where you have to have a, a, an earmarked tax measure uh, of, of two thirds, you know, to direct the money before you have, you gain some credibility with, uh, with the public. But, um, you know, I, 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 I feel like, you know, clearly the, uh, the, the, the utility tax is, in my opinion, is not worth the effort. Uh, I, 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 I definitely know that the city needs the money I don't feel like we're crying wolf, but uh, I can feel from the from the from the ballots that uh, there's there's just not enough support for it. 
Um, one thing that was really important to me, and I'm, I'm glad that the city council allowed the question to be on the, uh, the um, questionnaire about, you know, what would, you know, how important is it for you to save the bluff? Because, uh, you know, since I've been in this town, you know, the, uh, the, the we've witnessed the, the losing of Grand Avenue uh, to the point now where uh, we're pretty much going to end up with some dead end streets and we're gonna, we've already lost a portion of our walkway. And we all know that it's inevitable that unless we do something, which it sounds like it's not going to happen, the rest of that walkway will fall into the ocean. And sooner or later, probably maybe not in my lifetime, but uh, homes will follow that also. And, and uh, I know that the city had a chance to vote on this item about 15 years ago and actually voted not to do anything. And here we come to the, uh, to the citizens and say, hey, it's your town. Is this how you want to spend your money? And I know when they come back and say, no, we don't want to do that, then I guess you know, that sends a strong message that everybody's comfortable with the inevitable direction of, of the bluff. Um, as far as back to the city with the sales tax, um, I'm not even convinced that uh, there's enough of a percentage there to pursue that quarter percent. And, and uh, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I find it uh, to be an accurate report. I just find it to not to be you know, what we had hoped for. I know we spent money to uh, have the survey done, and as I look at it now, you know, every dollar that we spend is so critical, and now we have to make a decision about spending more money to put it on the ballot, although it's not a, a large amount of money because, uh, you know, we are, it is an election year. Um, I guess, uh, I, you know, I'm not prepared to make any motion right now. I, I'm, 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 I would rather wait on this and see, uh, you know, if the public was watching this and if they're paying attention to it and if, there's a different feeling out there from the public that they realize that our situation is grave. And, you know, just by the fact of the decisions we made with the budget. And uh, so I'm not we're, we're ready to make a recommendation tonight on, on any tax measure. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Bator. Uh, any additional comments uh, for discussion from the council? And if not, uh, does have a motion that they would be, uh, oh, Council Member Story, you have your hand up? Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to follow up with uh, Councilman Bortov and um, and also confirm that you know, the results of uh, this uh, survey and poll are not encouraging to me. Um, and I think the only one that would have any hope of being successful would be the sales tax. Um, but 59% um, is not a comfortable enough margin uh, to move forward with. Um, I reflect back to when we did a poll, it was about 10 years ago now in Measure O, um, and we got the results, and it came back at like 68, 69% of the residents supported a sales tax increase. And when the election actually happened though, it barely passed. I think it passed like in the uh, very low 50s. Um, so that gives me a lot of cause uh, for, you know, caution. Um, and I'm also concerned now with the talk about a second wave coming in the fall of, of how you know, trying to pass a tax measure would play against that if that were to happen. So I think for those reasons, um, we should just, you know, maybe take this information and, uh, um, and shelve it for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Story. Council Member Bertrand, I see you have your hand up, so we'll uh, call on you for some comments. I'm away just to grab my computer charger so that it does not die in the middle of our meeting. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, uh, go ahead with your comments. Yeah, I had to step away for a charger also. Um, yeah, it was a bit of disquiet to hear the results. Um, I remember when I heard the results for the um, library measure, you know, it was very close. But the thing that carried us over was the enthusiasm for the, the measure, you know, just almost unbridled enthusiasm across the county.
to put a measure on to support our, our library. And then the other thing to contrast on the opposite way is recently we've had a lot of measures for uh, schools that have lost. And um, I think this is our reality right now. And um, so I believe capital is left to its own devices right now, how we're going to manage our budget and how we're going to come to decisions on what's important for the city and its residents. Those are my comments. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Um, do we have any additional comments? Madam Mayor? Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just did want to just toss out a couple of different ways to think about this for the council based on the comments that I just heard. I think I'd have two options as a suggestion for how to proceed. I think one would be if the council at this point is firm that we're not going to do a, um, a ballot initiative, then let's just say that and we can move on past that. Alternatively, uh, as another option for a motion would be <clears throat> to continue this item to the next meeting in two weeks and we could see if we have more feedback and then make the decision. But uh, I think that that would be helpful to know because for staff standpoint, putting together the package for a ballot initiative does take some time and we only have two meetings between now and when, when it would be due. So I think it would be helpful to either make the decision that we're done with this or continue it to next meeting. <clears throat> and then that would give us a, the time we need either way. All right, thank you, Mr. City Manager. I see Vice Mayor Brooks has her hand up. Yes, um, I'm prepared to go with the first option. Our city uh, manager just shared with us that we will not be putting this on the ballot for this year. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Brooks and a second from Council Member Story. Um, uh, Council Member Bertrand, is your hand still up from your previous comments or do you have a new comment? Uh, no, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Um, my hand is not up. Sorry. Okay, no problem. If you hit the raise hand button and then you're done, the, the same button should then say lower hand and then it'll make it go away. Yeah. Um, so it looks like we don't have any additional comments. We have a motion and a second. Uh, so can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Bottorp. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Uh, th th thank you all. I'm sorry I didn't have better news for this time. No worries. Thank you so much for the presentation and for your work on this, Gene. We appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Well, fine. All right. Uh, final item for tonight, item 8D, consider fee schedule for fiscal year 2021. Turn it over to staff for a staff report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council members, so this is the fiscal year 2021 fee schedule for your consideration. <laughs> oh, sorry. Let me share my screen, hopefully correctly this time. Okay, that should be better this time. So um, just by way of background, uh, this is our annual review of the fee schedule as part of the budget process. Uh, our current fee schedule was adopted November 24th, 2015. And at that time, the consultant recommended that we do an annual review and a consumer price index increase. Since 2015, most fees have been increased each year by the San Francisco Bay Area CPI rate, which for fiscal year 2021, is 3.31 percent. However, at this time, staff is recommending that we do not implement a CPI increase on July 1st, and that the only changes were proposed is some minor fee amendments in the recreation fees. And just by way of what we've done the last few years, you can see um, we've been anywhere from 3 to 3.87 percent on our increases. So uh, I mentioned that there's a CASA service fee study that was completed in 2015 and best management practices recommend 
that you do that every five years. So we're, we're due for one this year. And we actually began that process in January, anticipating that we would be coming before council in, at the end of April with uh, recommendations for adjustments going into effect July of this year. But due to the fiscal impacts from the coronavirus pandemic, we slowed that process down, first to allow residents and businesses to continue to reach services without increasing fees while we're in these unprecedented fiscal times, and second to just allow city staff and the community to better understand the full fiscal impact associated with COVID-19. We do still plan on, uh, we are still working on the cost of service fee, and uh, we anticipate completing that towards the end of summer, early fall, and being before council in October this year, with any fee adjustments tentatively going into effect January 1st of 21, which would be the earliest. I think we need either 45 or 60 days lead time for land-based fees. So that's why that's schedule is. But we can, when we get to that point, we can decide if January 1st is the appropriate date or not. As far as uh, proposed fee amendments for this year, uh, we'd like to remove four weeks from the junior guard resident and non-resident fees. And this year we'll be running a two-week, we'll be running two-week sessions. But due to um, staffing requirements and social distancing protocols, our two-week sessions are going to be basically as expensive as four-week sessions, just the way we have to staff it and keep everybody separate. We'd also like to include a junior leader program fee, I think, I believe it's $6. Um, this is a program that we've offered for a number of years, but this year it's going to be a, a little more formal, offering job training skills such as CTR and first aid certification. And the fee really is to just recover the city's direct cost of that enhanced program. And finally, uh, we'd like to add a, a late pickup fee of $1 per minute. We already have this fee uh, with the after school program, and this would just make the junior guards and Camp Capitola programs consistent. And the reason is to encourage parents to pick up children in a timely manner. As I mentioned, the uh, staffing requirements and social distancing protocols makes it a little more challenging this year to, to deal with late pickups. So, um, so consistency and then just encouraging uh, the participants to be picked up in a timely manner. So our staff's recommendation is to conduct the public hearing that we're doing right now and adopt a resolution adopting the amended fee schedule for fiscal year 2021 as well as the animal services fees as set by Santa Cruz County. And that concludes my presentation. <laughs> happy to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, any questions from council? Vice Mayor Brooks has a question. Yeah, um, this may be for Katie. Or, so a while ago I had requested that the, um, the, the permits for folks who want to open up a child care facility in Capitola B waived. Is that in this is that reflected in this report mm -hmm. or is that some something else? Um, for that I believe we worked on a policy for the waiver for um, child care and that, that is that is in our fee schedule currently. Okay, so I would it be do I need to make mention of that for this particular fee schedule or? So, I, I believe it's in place oh. currently. so the fee schedule does include a note that says if budgeted funds are available, that the fees for the planning fees for child care facilities can be waived. Um, so that that is included in the budget. And I don't think there's any changes taking place. I don't believe there was any draw of those funds last year, and I think our finance director could confirm that, that those funds remain available. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure that we still have that in place for 2021. Thank you. Any additional questions from council members? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, we will now open public comment on this item. Are there any members of the public that would like to address the council? I do not see any um, people raise their hand in Zoom, Mayor Peterson, and I do not see any emails on this item. All right, with that, we will close public comment for this item, bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. Any comments? 
or discussion so that we approve the recommended action for the fee schedule for 2021. I'll second. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Brooks and a second by Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, if there's no additional comments, we will, uh, I will request a roll call vote, please. Okay, Councilmember Bertrand. Councilmember, uh, Council you're, you're muted. There you go. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Um, because we moved item uh, 8E to the City Council meeting on July 23rd and removed it from tonight's agenda, uh, that brings us to the end of tonight's meeting. Uh, so I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you so much for everyone who participated. Thank you to all the council members, all of our staff, BIA, residents. Um, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Have a good night.